Welcome to Let's Talk Cancer by the Union for International Cancer Control, an organization that unites and supports the cancer community to reduce the global cancer burden. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, Head of Communications and Marketing at UICC. I'll be taking over from our usual host today, Carrie Adams, while he's out of office. More than half of people with cancer are 65 years and older. Yet the quality of care given to them often doesn't meet their specific needs and can be inferior to that for younger adults. One reason is that early cancer symptoms can be mistaken for everyday pain or minor illnesses associated with old age, leading to late diagnosis. Another is the lack of programs and services, as well as geriatric oncology expertise. A third is the problem of ageism that pervades cultures and institutions and a sense that older adults may not be priority in the allocation of resources for cancer. With us today to discuss the causes and solutions is Dr. Enrique Soto from the National Institute of Medical Sciences and Nutrition in Mexico. Great to have you on this podcast, Enrique. A warm welcome. Hi, Nicole. Let me dive right into it. As life expectancy is increasing worldwide, the number of older adults with cancer will also grow. How is it then that cancer care for older adults remains somewhat of a niche topic that does not receive more attention? If we look at our waiting rooms, most people that are being treated for cancer are older adults, and still oncologists and many other healthcare providers fail to see this as a population that requires special attention. No? And I think that this uh, may be due to a lack of awareness. Many people are unaware of the things that they should be doing or that they could be doing to improve the care of, of their older patients, better ways to assess them, to evaluate them, to provide them support, and to tailor treat them uh, for their needs. No? Uh, quoting uh, Dr. Stuart Lichtman, who is one of the past presidents of the International Society of Geriatric Oncologists, in a way, every oncologist is a geriatric oncologist because most of the patients that we treat are older patients. Well, maybe with the exception of pediatricians who won't be seeing many, many older adults. Yes, and I believe that many medical schools still don't teach geriatrics from what I understand. So that's uh, also something that would probably be <laughs> important to change if we want to raise awareness and, you know, understanding of the issue. But while that is the case, what is the concrete impact on older patients living with cancer? I think that there are many ways in which we can assess the impact of this, no? So we know that providing geriatric center care and actually identifying issues other than the cancer diagnosis that are affecting the quality of life and the everyday activities of an individual is relevant. Uh, there are many things that we as oncologists are not trained to ask. No? And, and you correctly said it, uh, most universities in the world do not teach geriatrics. There is a global shortage of geriatricians. And as oncologists, we receive very little or no training in geriatrics at all. No? So these things like our, how our older adults are coping with their everyday activities, uh, nutritional status, things that have to do with depression and anxiety, falls, all of these things impacts the way in which an older adult lives through their cancer diagnosis from the moment of the diagnosis all the way through the survivorship phase. And taking into account this can actually improve the way in which we treat our patients and can make them uh, have a better quality of life. In addition, there is now evidence that shows that actually tailoring treatments and providing supportive care based on geriatric assessments can actually lead to improved cancer outcomes. So patients can actually have less toxicity, better quality of life, reduce hospitalizations if you implement this. And global societies such as the International Society of Geriatric Oncology or the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, now recommend performing a geriatric assessment or some form of geriatric assessment in every older patient that's about to start treatment because that's the best way in which we can know our patients better and do things that will actually improve the way they live. So you're really arguing for a patient-centered approach, which is something that is talked about in the health community with regards to any patient, right? It's, it's about um, respect for the patient. It means finding the best possible and most appropriate care in line with the person's uh, wishes and situation. But from what you're describing, the older people are particularly vulnerable and they have an immense need for such a, a patient-centered approach, I would say. 
would that also mean that invasive life-saving treatment is not necessarily the best solution for everyone? It makes no sense that we are practicing medicine and that we are treating patients without making patients the center of our care. No? So in a way, I like to think of geriatric oncology as precision medicine that is not tumor-centric, but rather patient-centric. So when you really get to know your patient beyond tumor type, beyond a, a small assessment of functional status, you can actually look at all the things that are going on in a holistic way, and you can actually align your uh, treatment and your expectations as a physician with the patient's expectations. There is a ton of data showing that sometimes what is important for us as physicians are not necessarily what matters to our patients. We actually did a very nice study. We presented it at the American Society of Oncology some years ago, in which we asked older patients that were getting chemotherapy, what was the most important outcome for them? And we asked them to rate different outcomes that included living as long as possible, maintaining my independence, being free from symptoms, preserving my cognitive abilities. And although about half of the patients chose survival as the most important outcome, almost half chose other things over survival. So for some of our patients, maintaining their functional abilities is far more important than living as long as possible. No? And for example, 80% of our patients said that they would rather die than lose their ability to think by themselves, to keep their cognitive abilities. So other outcomes are certainly as important or more important than survival. And in older patients, I think that one of the, of the things is that the way we measure time changes as we age. Uh, so uh, an example I always like to give is when, when I was a young kid, the time between my birthdays or the time between each Christmas seemed like forever. It was like, ah, Christmas is never happening. And now years go by extremely fast because you measure time with, with what you have lived before. So for a 90-year-old, if we are offering a toxic treatment that may have them coming to the hospital a lot for a three-month advantage in survival, it may not be as relevant uh, as for a younger adult. No? I mean, this changes from person to person. Some older persons value survival in a very high way. Uh, and the only way that we can know is asking. It makes a lot of sense. It's actually surprising that it's not happening more often, as you say. It's really about asking and not making any wrong assumptions. Um, linked to that, I'd like to bring in the, the notion of ageism and also misconceptions and prejudices um, surrounding cancer and aging. Uh, where do these misconceptions come from? Um, where do they originate? I mean, ageism uh, exists across cultures. It changes, of course, from culture to culture, but it exists at the patient level, I mean, patients are often ages towards themselves. So they believe that because they are older, they shouldn't be getting treatment or they shouldn't be being seen at, at high quality hospitals or they just don't deserve treatment. So there's a lot of self ageism. There is ageism across the healthcare system. So we have, as you correctly said, a lot of assumptions regarding what our patients value without even asking them. The healthcare system itself, the organization is ageist because most or a lot of public policies are mostly targeted towards younger individuals. There is ageism in the media. So ageism is everywhere. And actually the United Nations just published uh, a report on ageism that is extremely interesting and showing that this is a real problem for the future because, and again, something that doesn't make sense because if we are lucky, we eventually will be older patients now. So ageism is always a sort of discrimination against yourself because you will eventually, if you're lucky, be old and then you will be discriminated against. So it's a crazy form of discrimination because you're always discriminating against yourself or your future self. Actually, something that really brought ageism to the forefront was the COVID pandemic. We saw this a lot. Older adults were, so, were seen in many cases as disposable individuals, a disposable part of society. Older adults living in, in nursing homes had a very hard time. And these same things, even in, in a lower scale, because it's not something that is in the news every day, but these same things happen in cancer. So uh, family members do not take their older patients to the hospital if they have symptoms because, well, they're old, so it is, it is normal. Uh, 
I've had a lot of patients who, for example, feel lumps in their breasts. And because they're older, they just don't want to be a bother. They do not want to go to the hospital. So we need to have a systemic change in the way we see older age as something that is very valuable. And I think that we need to have uh, people with geriatric expertise in decision-making uh, capacity, in, in decision-making panels, in cancer plans, and patient voices. I think there is a lack an alarming lack of older patient voices out there. And how can health systems be prepared to facilitate such a holistic approach and a holistic approach that also includes uh, a potential treatment of other um, diseases that older people might have um, in addition to cancer? It could be dementia, it could be uh, diabetes and other NCDs. Um, how could that system be prepared to facilitate such a holistic approach? A single physician with a single specialty is uh, in most cases insufficient to provide adequate care for another patient. So I think that systems need to evolve to a multidisciplinary approach to care for the older individual. So as an oncologist working alone, you're very limited in the kind of things that you can do. But there are other healthcare providers that are available across healthcare systems that are sometimes underutilized for the treatment of older patients. So having these teams that include healthcare professionals, mental health professionals, nutritionists, physical therapists that are often available at the country or regional level and are not used specifically for treating older patients. So do I believe that in the future we will have geriatricians everywhere or that every older patient globally will be seen by a geriatrician. I don't think that will happen, but I don't think that healthcare systems need to uh, figure out or find out that providing this multidisciplinary care and conducting assessments for older patients, identifying these vulnerabilities and treating them in a holistic way using personnel that's already there can actually lead to great improvements in care. No? So I think they're very there are various models of care for, for geriatrics that are mostly based on primary care, on outreach in the community, and that adapting those things uh, for cancer care can actually produce great benefits at costs that are uh, reasonable for most healthcare systems. So this is not something that needs uh, $20,000 per dose drugs. No? These are things that require awareness, finding the teams, talking to patients. Uh, so in a way, it's sometimes more complicated, but also a, a cheaper, I think, and easier to implement and certainly cost effective. We know that the problem is bigger in low and lower middle income countries, not only for older patients living with cancer, but for all cancer patients. Um, you wrote in a blog for UICC recently that in order to improve the care um, for older patients, but also for others with cancer, we need to develop global initiatives. Uh, could you explain this need for global initiatives and uh, you know a partnership approach that you have in mind? I think that this can be done from the clinical standpoint, the research standpoint, and the educational standpoint. So we need to be able to build collaborations in which people from low and lower middle income countries receive training in high quality excellence centers in high income nations. I think that this, this educational collaboration needs to happen. And then we need to build models that are able to be adapted to the local setting. So. I don't believe that the way forward is copying the models that are done in high income nations, but we do need to learn about how these processes work and then bring them back to our setting and adapting it to available resources. And I think that, that this is feasible and in the future it could lead to the creation of centers of excellence in low and middle income countries that could eventually also lead to South-South collaborations. And I think that's, that's the future now, this collaboration between low and middle income countries uh, in order to improve the way that cancer care is, is provided for other patients. Also in the research arena, I think there is a need to create global projects, cancer and aging. There is a need for funding. Uh, I know that there are some initiatives uh, looking at funding for, for example, young investigators, etc., in low and middle income countries. For example, UICC has the technical fellowships and we've sent some of our fellows to train in cancer and aging related issues uh, in high income nations. And then they've come back and started interesting projects in our center. So 
that is a great example for me of, of, a, of a global collaboration. So I think there is a, a lot to be done and we can work together in creating clinical practice guidelines that are uh, resource stratified, uh, global projects looking at implementation of geriatric oncology. Uh, so I think the possibilities are endless. And as time goes by and uh, the older population starts to grow, this will be more and more of an issue. So we need to be prepared and uh, and start doing things before it's a problem. No? And there's also the ICCP, the International Cancer Control Partnership, to assist uh, especially low and lower middle income countries and the ministries of health and uh, cancer control planning. So that's another good uh, partnership approach. On that note, I just want to add that, for example, uh, uh, there is w ongoing work on the new National Cancer Control Plan for Mexico. And we are actually, we've been able to include now a section on uh, geriatric oncology and older adult care, which, again, surprisingly, is missing from most national cancer control plans. So uh, this is, this again, a niche that shouldn't be a niche. No? Every cancer control program, every cancer control plan should include specific things related to older individuals. There is no doubt in my mind. We do need better data and a better understanding to improve uh, cancer care for older adults living with, with cancer. Um, could you maybe explain to us which role uh, clinical trials can play in that? Um, because um, some of our um, audience might not be aware of this. So what, what is the role of clinical trials? And should more older adults be included in clinical trials? The answer to that question is, of course. No? Most clinical trials and registration clinical trials of cancer drugs include a population that is very different from the population we see in everyday clinical practice. No? So the median age for diseases is 10, 15 years above the median age of the registration clinical trials. And what this means for practicing oncologists is that they're making decisions on patients based on data that does not actually represent those patients because those patients were just not included in the clinical trial. No? And of course, that's a problem because we're, we're making decisions based on evidence that does not apply to the patient in front of us in the office. No? And I think that there have been some recent changes about that. I mean, now the NCI, for example, in the US requires inclusion across the lifespan. So you cannot, can no longer have age limits in clinical trials. I feel very sad when I see clinical trials that have upper age limits. I mean, this year, just the ASCO annual meeting, one of the plenary session abstracts from Japan, of all places, had an upper age limit, which makes no sense, but for Japan even less, because we know that this is a country that is has a large, large population of older patients. No? So eliminating upper age limits from clinical trials, basing inclusion on other parameters, physiological age parameters rather than chronological age parameters. Uh, there are some trials that are focused on their patients that are including these outcomes and that are very interesting and I think more and more will come in the future. Older patients love to be in clinical trials. There is a ton of evidence showing that if you offer clinical trials to older patients, they will participate. And this is another example of ageism because in most cases, what happens is that researchers do not even offer trials to older patients. And this is because of misconceptions related to whether older patients would even want to participate, whether there is benefit or not. And so uh, this is another example of ageism in, in research. No? Looking ahead, what do you see in the future for the field of cancer and aging? I think there are a lot of positive developments, many international organizations that are very influential worldwide, like UICC, ASCO, ESMO, are including more of a geriatric oncology focus in their programs, in their guidelines, in their meetings. These things will eventually, I believe, lead to policymakers including these topics into actual cancer control programs and national cancer laws. And I think that eventually, and we're starting to see this, Clinical practice guidelines and planning of cancer care will include geriatric expertise. And this is happening already worldwide now. For example, also here in Mexico now, in the breast cancer clinical cancer guidelines, we have included geriatric oncology. So we're working towards that. And I think there is a very, very enthusiastic group of people in cancer and aging that are working towards uh, making this happen. 
uh, and I think that the the, the future uh, looks bright. No, uh, I think that that we are we are doing things, and the community is picking up on this and seeing that this is something that is that is needed. Uh, and I see that in the future, this will stop being a niche. I don't believe that every patient will be seen by a geriatric oncologist, but I don't think that in the future we will be able to, and this is a sort of a made up word, but to geriatricize other healthcare providers so that they have this awareness when they are seeing an older patient in clinic or designing a clinical trial or building a, an educational program. On this positive note, Enrique, thank you so much for sharing your insights today and the audience for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Cancer. Cancer and aging will also be an important topic at this year's World Cancer Congress in Geneva. If you want to know more, visit our website or follow us on social media.